Okay, so welcome back. This is going to be our final screencast for chapter 16. And in 16.4, we are going to wrap up this chapter by looking at all of the lines of evidence that have been collected up to this point to verify that evolution actually occurs. Now, the very first line of evidence that we're going to look at is called biogeography. And what you notice here is we actually have two words wrapped up into one. If you look at the prefix right here, you'll notice that bio, of course, is going to refer to biology, which means living things, and geography is going to refer to location. So when you think about biogeography, you need to think about where organisms actually live now compared to where their ancestors had lived in the past. Now we're going to break biogeography down into two different areas. First one being closely related organisms, but somewhat different. Now Darwin noticed that certain species very locally. In other words, when he had talked about his finches, he had noticed that there were several birds on these Galapagos Islands that were very similar to each other, but they had each sort of developed beaks that were a little bit different from each other based on the type of food that you found on those islands. So in this case, for biogeography, we're talking about organisms that are very closely related, but what they've done is they've actually differentiated, which means they've changed. And it's usually due to very slight climate changes that have occurred in those localized areas. And so that sort of influences the type of structures that might be needed in those areas. Now the second category of biogeography is where you discuss organisms that are distantly related but they still appear somewhat similar. And Darwin had noticed that there were species that actually varied globally. And if you notice over here on the right hand side we're bringing back the idea of the armadillo. Now it says distantly related species will develop similarities based on similar environments that they live in. So in this case, if you look at the similarities between these four animals, all of them have, well, relatively long snouts, the body shape is pretty much the same, and if you notice, all of them have a pretty significant tail. But of course, they live on different continents, and so the idea here is that on each of these different continents, we have habitats, we have environments that are very similar to each other, so the idea is that these organisms sort of evolved or changed to become very similar to each other based on the influence of that environment. Now the second piece of evidence that we use to help to um, validate whether or not evolution actually occurs is the age of the Earth and the fossils that you might find on this planet. Now, back during Darwin's time, of course, he had found many, many fossils, and he helped to sort of use those to back up his concept of evolution. But during that time, it was really hard to, I guess you would say, date those fossils. In other words, you could see similarities maybe between structures of the organisms that were around during that time, and of course, the fossils that they had located or found. But in terms of how you actually show that they're related to each other, it was pretty limited. But today, we have lots of technology that helps us to sort of date those fossils a lot more accurately than Darwin could. And so what we have is something called radioactive dating. And so this helps us to determine the age of certain rocks, and it can also help us to determine the age of fossils as well. If you look over here on the right-hand side, you're going to notice that we have a fossil being represented right here. And so if you notice, it says that living organisms tend to absorb a certain element. It's a radioactive element. It's called carbon-14, or C14, and they do this during their lifetime. But when they become fossilized, what happens is that this particular radioactive element will begin to decay. And so what scientists could actually do is they can take a small piece of the fossil, they can burn that piece up, and they can actually get that piece to produce carbon dioxide gas. Well, from that gas, they found that there are two different types of carbon being emitted. They have what we call a stable carbon-12 that's being produced, but we also have a radioactive carbon-14 that's being produced as well. And so what a scientist will do is, since certain types of radioactive elements like carbon-14 will sort of decompose at a certain rate, and it's a pretty predictable rate, what they can do is they can actually count the number of electrons that are being produced, which is what happens when um, radioactive materials actually decay, they can determine the number of electrons that are being produced and get a rough idea as to how old that fossil might be. Now, of course, in addition to the technology that we now have, we also need to understand that now we actually have more fossils that have been discovered as opposed to what was looked at back in the 1800s. And so a lot of those holes, a lot of those gaps that might have been around during Darwin's time have now basically been filled in. In other words, the discovery of more intermediate stage fossils now helps to fill in those holes. And so the whole idea, for example, 
of, let's say for example, a fish actually developing over a long period of time to maybe become an amphibian, a reptile, a bird, or even a mammal, can kind of be verified because we found more fossils. In other words, maybe this area right here maybe wasn't recognized during Darwin's time because there were no fossils that were present, but now we've discovered many more species, many more common ancestors that show sort of a gradual development of those limbs that you would find in those modern amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals of today. Now, a third piece of evidence would be actually comparing anatomy and embryology. And what we're going to do on this screen is we're going to look at the anatomical piece in particular. Now, when you talk about anatomy, what we do is we often talk about things called homologous structures. Now, we've seen this prefix before, and we know that this prefix is going to mean same. So in this case, we have animals with similar structures that have evolved from a common ancestor with a basic version of a certain structure. And oftentimes we refer to that as descent with modification. So over here on the right towards the top, we have four different organisms. We have, actually we have five different organisms. We have a frog, an alligator, a chicken, a horse, and down here we have an ancient lobe finned fish. Now, when you talk about a lobed fin fish, you're talking about a fish that actually has sort of a fleshy type of fin. Now, the idea here is that this would be considered the common ancestor to all of the animals that you see right here. Now, all of these animals have homologous structures because if you notice, there is a very strong similarity between the appendage or leg of this um, frog and the alligator and even the forelimb of the chicken where you would find the wing and of course the leg of the horse. The idea here is that all four of these structures actually are being used to do the same exact thing, but they've been modified over a period of time. Now we know they're similar because if you notice they're kind of color-coded here. In other words, there are certain bones that are purple, certain ones that are yellow, certain ones that are orange. Well, the idea is they're all homologous because you find those types of bones in all of these animals. And you also find it in the ancient common ancestors. So again, this is descent. These um, animals have descended from this ancient common ancestor, but they've been modified. Now, but you need to be very careful here. You can't confuse common structure with something called common function. Because when you look at the function of these particular structures, like down here on the right, you're going to notice we actually have three different examples. We have a bat wing, a bird wing, and an insect wing. All of these structures have the ability to um, basically allow that animal to fly, but they are not considered homologous because the structures that actually make up these three different types of um, appendages are not the same. In other words, you don't have the similarities between the bones like you see up here, so the color coding is not the same. We call them analogous structures. They're not homologous. In other words, they all three do the same thing, but they're much, much more distantly related from each other. Now, also, you need to remember that not all homologous structures have important functions. In fact, there are a lot of them out there that are considered vestigial, which means they are inherited, but that structure has actually lost most, if not all, of their original function. Now, a good example of this is on the right-hand side here. If you think about us, we actually have muscles that are found in our ears, and if you notice, there are some people out there that can actually make their ears move. Um, we're not quite sure why those muscles have stuck around. You know, what is the advantage to having ear muscles? What is the advantage to having an eyebrow? What is the advantage to having eyelashes? Tonsils, again, another good example of a vestigial structure. A thymus gland, you know, what is the purpose of that? Male nipples. Why do, why do men need to have nipples? You know, they don't have to nurse their young. So again, these are all considered vestigial structures because even though they're still around and we can pass them on to our offspring, um, they really don't have any function in the living organism. Now again, that third piece of evidence, we had anatomy and embryology. Now this one's a pretty kind of a, a significant one because if you notice on the right, we have several different examples of embryos that come from different animals. For example, the rabbit, the calf, the hog, the chick, the tortoise, the salamander, and the fish. Well, the idea here is that when you look at the embryos for all of these different organisms, at the very beginning when development begins, you're going to notice they are very similar to each other in terms of shape and the structures you might find on that embryo. And actually, as you kind of progress further on, the similarities definitely do start to diminish a bit, but there's still some similarities between the organisms. Then, of course, as you progress along and you get to almost full term for each of these organisms, then, of course, they become very different.
but the similar pattern of embryological development is going to provide that further evidence that there must have been some sort of common ancestor for all of the organisms that you see represented on this picture. Now the very last piece of evidence of evolution is going to be genetics and molecular biology. Now most of us know of course by this time that life has a common genetic code. So all living organisms will use DNA of course and RNA to carry information not only from one generation to the next but also to direct the synthesis or the making of certain proteins in those organisms. Now an easy way to think about this is to look at these three examples down here. We have a mouse, we have a whale, and we have a chicken. And remember that DNA code is made up of four different letters, the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's. Well, what you simply need to do is you need to look at the comparison of the genetic code among all three of these. Now, the less difference that you have between two organisms, that would indicate that they are more closely related to each other. So if you compare the mouse with the whale, the only differences that you see would be here, 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 and here. So there's four differences between these two animals. That would indicate that when you compare these two together, which seem to be somewhat similar, in other words, more closely related, and let's say, for example, you take um, maybe the mouse and the chicken, when you compare them two, we have quite a few more differences taking place between those two as opposed to between the mouse and the whale. And so the indicator here is that the mouse and the chicken are much more distantly related from each other than the mouse and the whale. So again, just comparing those letters will allow you to be able to look at how closely related two organisms may be. All right, so that's going to finish up our very last screencast for Chapter 16. Please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.